Well, hello again, everybody. This is Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com. Today is the 152nd episode of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. It's a hot day here on July 4th here in Murray, Utah. Uh, welcome to everybody to our episode. Uh, the questions have been great lately, and I really appreciate it. Reminder, if you have a question, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I'm here to answer each and every one of your questions, and I'm glad to do it. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, we got a lot today, so let's pound through them, okay? Ian has a question for us. As we all know by now, yes, I always love those sentences, and then I spend the rest of my career explaining that to everybody else who doesn't know that. There aren't many one-size-fit-all routines in life. That being said, is there a series of mobility drills you would recommend that would help most, if not all people, to practice a few times a week? If you go to Dan John University or you go to my YouTube page, you'll find two exercises. One's called the Stony Stretch, S-T-O-N-E-Y. It's named after my good friend Stony, who I, who actually helped me develop a lot of really interesting uh, uh, movements. Um, and and thank you to Stony. Uh, a Stony movement in my language is that cross country ski position. Um, you know, when when you do a six point rock. Uh, that's your hands, knees, and feet off the ground. When you raise your knees up off the ground, I call it the bear position. So knees down is six point, knees up is bear. So knees down would be like a half kneeling or a lunge. Knees up, that one knee up would be the cross country ski position. And basically you take a suspension trainer or whatever you have. Uh, when I travel, door frames are wonderful. Uh, and you stick your, your hands, your elbows, whatever, and you do a step deep into it and kind of lunge into it. And so you're stretching your pecs, your biceps, your hip flexors, and weirdly your hamstrings. And then other people say, oh, this is the best stretch for X. The other exercise I do, uh, this is my two-part mobility movement, is called the windmill stick. Uh, I have, I think I do it three or four different times on my YouTube station. And it's interesting because you can see the weather change by the clothes and the snow outside. It's kind of fun to do that sometimes when you show something a couple of times. So those, the stony stretch and the windmill stick would be uh, the first general one. Number two would be the one uh, most of my people do every day now. You hang, uh, I now do a bent knee hang, but that's just because I'm trying to loosen up my lower back even more. You hang for whatever, 30 seconds. And the other one is you sit at the bottom of the goblet squat. So stony stretch, windmill stick, complex but amazing. Hang, sit at the bottom of the goblet squ squat, amazing and simple. And then the other thing for mobility would be anything from Tim Anderson's original strength. Every day I do rocks, nods, uh, egg rolls, prone uh, nods, um, and of course I walk every day, which sounds weird, but it's one of the best mobility things I do. We have a question from Andrew. More than once you said you, that there are things you learn in the high school bus full of athletes you cannot learn anywhere else. I wrestled for five years and pole vault for, for two. This is my senior year in high school and I still cannot figure out what you meant. Would you please enlighten me? I would just love to find the value in what you see in those bus rides with the team. Well, for one thing, you're going to learn a lot about people on bus rides. Uh, I, I remember those dark nights, you know, after track meets and football games. You know, the celebration of the sadness or whatever is over. And I just talked to my athletes like like human persons. And it was, and that was wonderful. And in fact, not long ago, in fact, it was November. I bumped into one of my students who was having a real hard time in high school. And he noted that. And I remember the conversation. He, he talked about a particular issue he was going through in his life and how unappreciative teenagers are about this issue. And uh, we talked to me and another student. Uh, we just talked. We talked for probably two hours. It was just three gentlemen talking about a situation and we, no one could leave. So to me, that's the kind of thing. Now, you're a high school team and I don't know what your team's like, but, but when I was at Utah State, my favorite parts of bus rides was talking to what people were learning in school. So at Utah State, we had something called animal husbandry, which sounds a little, little frightening until you find out it's, it's, it's of course, it's looking for optimal breeding uh, of, of, you know, farm animals. 
but you know, discovering what you know what these guys were studying in school, and then you talk to a geography major, and he he would start telling us about something. And then you talk to I don't know an accountant major, and I don't know, two of my teammates uh, were getting themselves ready for chiropractic college. So what they were working on with anatomy was fascinating. So to me, that's the best. We have a question from JD, and JD says, "I am an adult." And I have never really trained before. I'm not massively overweight, but I feel very weak and soft. Do you have any suggestions on how to build muscle for the first time? Boy, I got to tell you, uh, JD, uh, I I kind of wish I was you because that first time you get that beginner's rush. That is marvelous. Uh, I know I need to focus on strength as well, but it seems like I need to build some muscle before I can create some strength. What program would you recommend? What's the best way to get started? Yeah, I, I like your question a lot because uh, the answer is so simple for me. Um, uh, join danjohnuniversity.com, go to the workout generator, tell the generator what equipment you have, then pick three days a week. So maybe you could do four or five and focus more on mobility those two days because you say you're an adult. And I would just follow along. Uh, it's going to be real simple stuff. Uh, this is going to sound to our experienced trainers kind of boring, but if you do three sets of eight for a couple of weeks, then three sets of 10 with the same load, and then three sets of 12, and the basics of push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry, the loaded carry and the hinge is going to be a little different, but don't worry about that right now. Marvelous things will happen and the results will stick. Uh, you just need a basic training program. I'm begging you not to get involved in the blitzing and the bombing and the burning and all that stuff. Uh, what I'd like you to do is learn the basic movements first. Learn the basic strength movements. Do them. If you're not squatting, all the blitzing and bombing in the world is not going to help you, as we find out. So it's that simple. Uh, obviously, uh, you, you might have to have some nutritional tweaks uh, only because you say I'm not massively overweight. And what a blessing to you, JD. That is great to hear because that's it's much easier to build lean body mass if you don't have to do a whole bunch of stuff with um, you know adipose tissue uh, fat. We have a question from Tim. My granddaughter has played basketball for five years. Started with upwards, all right? She now also plays volleyball and is a sprinter, long jumper. This season was her first at track and field. She gained eight pounds of what looks to be mostly muscle. Huh, good for her. Huh. She wants to start lifting weights to help her in sports. This brings joy to my heart. What is a good summer weight program? Well, I'm going to tell you the same thing I've been telling people since literally 1971. Go to my websites, type in my name, type in Dan John, type in Southwood. Uh, one word, uh, South, S-O-U-T-H, Wood. It's the program that Coach Freeman taught me. 864 Power Clean Military Front Squat Bench Press. It's all most youth athletes will ever need. And if she's honestly playing three sports a year, hats off to you. Uh, the follow-up to this question is, what is a good weight program during the different seasons? Whatever you can get in. Uh, I like. I always like lifting after competition, um, especially at home meets. I can remember in the ninth grade, we had a track meet up at the high school, which was great for me because it was so short of a walk. I came home and I went in the back backyard because I lost. And I did a whole bunch of inclines, bench press, front squat, um, you know, all the lifts I knew at the time. Uh, so I like to train after competition or the day after competition as best I can. But with these club sports, this whatever, these club sports and some of these volleyball club sports, there is no off days. But... Ideally, the day of, day after competition, and then I, ideally, if say I could compete on Saturday, uh, the Wednesday would be a good day for a heavy day. Now, sadly, because uh, youth sports just seems to play, 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 that might be hard to get in. We got a question from Nathan, and I like this question. I, I just enjoy this question. I'm going to be closing on my first home in about a month. Our yard will become with a our yard will come with a pretty large raised vegetable garden. I have no experience at all with gardening, but I've heard you mention yours in the podcast a few times. Do you have any advice for a first time gardener, uh, particularly with respect to vegetables and herbs? Um, 
with herbs, it's now I live in a high desert, so uh, what, what grows well here are what I focus on now. Um, so I have a massive uh, mint garden. I have six different varietals in there, and of course, where I live, mint uh, mint quickly becomes a weed. Uh, it's interesting about what a weed is. So if you have, if you want a lawn of grass and mint grows in it, mint is a weed. If you have a mint farm and grass goes, it grows in it, grass is a weed. So it all just depends on, <laughs> that's, I just think that there's some value in life. Uh, there's a, like a life lesson there somehow, you know, and you might not be, you might be a weed. You're just in the wrong place, you know? Um, First time gardener with herbs, uh, uh, let's just do it this, we'll, we'll make it the simplest way. I would go to a local, not chain, but a local uh, gardening place and ask them what grows best. Uh, it might be worth you to bring in, uh, this is gonna sound weird, but take like a shovel full of your soil with you. And again, that sounds weird. In my garden, uh, I destroyed my, uh, not proud of this, but I destroyed most of my vegetables this year because I let my soil get too hot. And I'm not talking about the sun on them. I'm talking about, uh, the, uh, I put a lot of extra um, potting soils and things like that on them. And I, I, I burned up all of my, uh, my vegetable crop. Uh, that's happened to me one other time. And I'm starting to get a sense of my timing was the issue, not so much my potting. Uh, I, I should have waited another week or two um, before I did this. I, it, oh, it'll be saved and I'll be fine. I'll be, um, in fact, uh, I just saw them there. They're on my desk. My, I'm going to be planting squash this next week. So where I live, sunflower seeds, uh, anything that's vines. Uh, Utah would have been one of the greatest, uh, uh, you know, wine producing places in the world, except for uh, the way we run our state <laughs> with the politics and the other stuff. But here in Utah, uh, vines grow very, very well. Sunflower seeds grow very well. In the herb area, the more mint family grows well. Uh, once you pick up a mint and you look at like, uh, well, I think rosemary, I want to say rosemary and basil are up. Those big, thick, powerful stemmed uh, herbs grow well here. And other stuff just doesn't. So you might want to find out what grows well. Oddly, squashes grow well here, the, the, the winter fruits. After that massively hot summer, uh, once they come up, they, they do quite well. It's interesting because watermelon grows so well in certain parts of Utah. Where I used to live on the river, uh, I, I grew my own asparagus on the river bed and watermelons. All I did was plant them and walk away. And I, I'm sure there's still rows of asparagus that are, that are self-harvesting. Um, get good advice. Um, don't overdo it the first year. Uh, if you are going to plant, like I, I like sunflower seeds and, uh, and I like, I like sunflowers and I like mint. Once you decide to plant those, that's it. You're, not, you're done with those. Uh, certain things will be that way. They will take over a garden spot. Um, if you're going to do things like potatoes, I would recommend those potato bags. I wouldn't even plant them anymore. Uh, you can find those uh, online quite easily. They're called potato bags. You fill them with dirt and then they grow right in the bag. And your harvest is just going to spill them on the ground uh, in your garden and pull the, uh, the new potatoes out. <sighs> with herbs, uh, I'd be go real small the first year and make sure it's easy enough to take inside because herbs can be a little bit more dainty. Well, thank you. That's a great question. We have a question from Hamish. That's a great name. I just finished up uni for the first year, and since finals, mid-April, I've really fallen off my lifting, and that's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. You finish a life event, it's okay to take a, uh, take a break. Uh, I just got back from a uh, trip to Scotland, lucky you, and I hated feeling weaker by the day. I know that feeling. Uh, I've run starting strength before, but never achieved any impressive level of strength. Would you rec recommend running easy strength, or do you think I should run a more... Yeah, Hamish, I mean, come on. You, 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 you asked me on my podcast if, I should do, if you should do easy strength or s somebody else's program. Well, yeah, of course I think you should do easy strength. 
I mean, I know you just got out of Scotland, but you know, come on now, think this through. Of course, I recommend easy strength. I don't believe in linear periodization. Outside of beginners, I don't think it exists. And yeah, I know you can go to the forums and they'll tell you follow the program and you know do this and this and that. truth is linear periodization is really tough to work. Marty Gallagher gets it, Gallagher gets it to work, but remember what Marty does. He has that intense 12 week linear periodization. Then he has you take a month off, 16 week in some cases. Then you take a month off. Uh, you do all, uh, easy cardio. You build it back up. You get yourself ready. And then boom, you're back into that 16 week focused. You know, if you do two 16 week linear periodizations a year, that's 32 weeks. You take off, you, know, you take off two months between those big peaks. That's putting you at 40 weeks a year and 12 weeks to prepare yourself for those peaks. I mean, yeah, that's linear, but that's a, a lot of undulating uh, linear. Uh, and, I, and he finishes off with one really important point. Thanks a ton for your health and congratulations on the best strength and conditioning podcast. Well, by saying that, I forgive you for asking about somebody else's program. No, I, I'm not a big believer in those linear programs. I think I'm pretty clear about that. We have a question from Jacob, and this is going to be a very quick question, a very quick answer. Is peaking of any use for the military athlete? No, none. Um, in many things, uh, aspects of life, there is no such thing as peaking. Uh, even if you're an elite athlete, you got to be very careful about what you peak for. Um, if it's an Olympic year and you peak for the Olympic trials, you know, you might show up flat at the Olympic finals and, you know, uh, at the at the host country. Now, having said that, you know, you might have to throw the best or compete the best of your life to make the team, and then you flounder at the finals, which happens quite a bit. Um, peaking has almost no value for SWAT teams, uh, collision occupations, even collision sports. Um, I always joke when I work with a, a program and it's not doing well, I always say, well, we were you know, we were peaking for the Super Bowl or whatever, you know, and everyone laughs because, you know, you know, we lost every game. Um, so is peaking of any uh, use for a military uh, person? I don't think so. When the alarm goes off, when the bell goes off, you have to be ready to go. And there's no way you can plan for that. Luis asks a question. Question here for you all the way from the UK. I'm a Muay Thai fighter. Muay Thai fighter, and on my two days off, I wondered what you would do, suggest to do with a minimal kettlebell and bodyweight program. I will be doing my strength conditioning from home. I compete in the 57K class, although I walk around at 65 or so, I do the same thing. I have an 18K and a 24K kettlebell, as well as a pull-up bar and plenty of empty space. I wonder what you would suggest along the lines of minimalism and maybe even a two-lift program to supplement my fighting and give some general strength advice. My goal will be to get strong and conditioned without gaining too much mass. Any help would be appreciated. Well, you know, I work with those UFC guys in the number, I mean, uh, I put them instantly on easy strength. I mean, uh, we do weighted pull-ups, weighted half kneeling presses. Uh, if they can, we swing a lot. Uh, with you, I would have you do double bells with those uh, uneven loads. Uh, I, I like 18 and 20. I'd prefer 12 and 24, you know, or, you know, 48 and 24, but this is fine. I like one to be half size, but that's just a, maybe a personal thing. So double bell swings with the two of them. Uh, I, I like the, the idea of you doing offset kettlebell front squats. We have a question from Jamie. I have some travel coming up soon and would really like to get in some reading during this time. I'm a trainer by profession and I've read many strength and conditioning, fitness and exercise books from Pavel, Tim Anderson, Mike Boyle, and this other chap, John Dan, or something like that. I'd like any suggestions you have for a book or books that are not necessarily intended for fitness professionals, but have offer relative insights to benefit me as a father, husband, business owner, and coach. What do you think? And finally, yes, are you gonna be in Galway this year? Uh, I'd like to, Jamie, I'll see if I can make it work. So let's see, back here, I have the collected works of Derek Sivers. Derek, D-E-R-E-K, Sivers, S-I-V-E-R-S. 
How to Live. I love this book. Hell Yeah or No. And someone put a coffee on there. Anything you want. Your music and people. And the other one, Anything You Want. Oh, yeah, this, this book, Anything You Want, is... Uh, yeah, anything you want is uh, the book that changed my uh, business career. This book by Earl Nightingale, uh, uh, available at nightingale.conant. Oh, uh, Derek's books. Uh, just just Google Derek Sivers, S-I-V-E-R-S. I think it's Derek Sivers dot, and I, it's not com, but it's something along those lines. Earl Nightingale's book, Your Success Starts Here. I love this book um, from Nightingale Conant uh, Publishing easy to find online so those would be my great goes to but there is another book i have hold on a second uh yeah and i don't care if you love or hate uh tony robbins i guess i found out a lot of people do but his book giant steps i'm a huge fan of it's a uh, it's one of those great books that uh, i grew up reading my mom and i used to read a, a book every day together called three minutes a day it was just a short little motivational book and kind of a positive thinking book and it's it's kind of nice. It's some of the best memories of my life. Thanks for sharing. This book can be read like that, one one uh, one page at a time. Uh, his training, uh, he, he likes Maffie Tone. He likes Stu Middleman. Uh, I know since he's written this book, he's gotten into a whole bunch of different things. And, you know, his nutrition program that was in uh, The Edge, you know, where you have vibrations, you measure the vibrations in your food and stuff. I'm not ripping on it, but, you know, it's just, it just seems outside of my world. Um, those are a good start. Uh, they're all uh, uh, very reasonably priced. Um, that's not a bad start. I, I like success books, but sometimes they get dated pretty hard and pretty fast. Um, it doesn't bother me if I, like, if I grew up at the time, like the 60s or 70s, if it's Earl Nightingale and the materials dated, I'm fine. Because I understand what he's referencing. You know, Earl tends to be, you know, speak uh, the language at the time, which some modern readers wouldn't like. Um, I'm looking over there at some of my favorite books. The Track and Field Omni book, uh, Tommy Kono's uh, Weightlifting Olympic Style, and some of these other books that I just love. But, you know, I don't know how, how hard those are. Easy to get those. <clears throat> but... If you read anything from Derek, uh, Earl Nightingale, or, and Tony Robbins, I think you're doing okay. I, I read and listen to some other success people, but I, like in one case, the person's pol personal politics, their personal, they say things that I can't, I don't want to defend, and so I can't recommend this one author I'm thinking about. Um, and there's some others the same way. And I'm not saying they're not like, you know, they don't march around with swastikas or anything, but they, they say some things that would rub most people wrong. You know, um, I do believe that, you know, certain people are born with more advantages and I'll go to my death believing that. And if you tell me that, you know, you're, you know, you're, you, 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 you're all alone and raising yourself to the top. I always struggle with that a little bit. Hey, well, listen, that was a great set of questions today. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, remember, if you have questions, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'm here to answer each and every one of them. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.